All right, a membrane's job is just never done, Tim. Never done. <sighs> Ready, Maria? Ready, Michelle? Ready, Elvis? Let's go, man. What does a membrane do? Number one, it provides shape. Nobody knows that tear up better than a pathologist. Pathologist looks in a microscope, tissue biopsy, and says, oh, it looks like squamous cells in here. Aha, this must be skin. The only problem is he's looking at brain biopsy. That's how he knows you got metastatic cancer to your brain. So shape of a cell, pathologists use it more than anybody else. By looking at shape, you can tell where this cell came from, okay? So that's the number one thing. Number two, all membranes are amphipathic, coming from the word amphibious, son, deep. Amphibious, water, land, except this time we're talking about fat-soluble, water-soluble, okay? Hydrophilic means water-loving, so water-soluble. Hydrophobic means they hate water, so fat-soluble. You understand, Nicole? You understand, then B? Cool. All right. Hydrophobic wants to be on the inside. Hydrophilic wants to be on the outside. Why would that be, Rashmi? She says to herself, no problem. <laughs> fat loves fat. Water loves water. Fat hates water. Water hates fat. You understand, Kathia? What does water hate more than anything else, Kathia? Fat. What does fat hate more than anything else, Tara? Water. Water. Fuck Kathia saying herself, Dr. Francis, I don't know. I was cooking a pot of soup the other day, and I saw fat and water mix. I said, really? Oh, I don't know about that. All right, tell you what. Let's say you take a pot of hot water, and you put a drop of oil on one side. You know what that oil does? It starts bouncing around. Oh, I hate water. Oh, I hate water. Oh, I hate water. Oh, I hate water. Oh, I can't stand. Oh, water everywhere. Oh, my God. Where are we going? Oh, what am I to do? He's looking for another piece of fat. Okay, let me help him out. I put another drop of oil on the other side of the pot. You know what they start doing? Oh, I hate water. Oh, I hate water. Oh, I hate water. What am I going to do? Oh, I hate water. Oh, I hate water. Then they run into each other. Ah! Ah! Hey, how you doing? Hey, your sister's over here. Hey, what's up, Susie? They'll bounce around that pot till they find each other. And then what are they going to do? Hug tightly. What? That's why you get one big clump. And then Kathy says to me, Dr. Francis, I don't know. By the time I finished cooking that soup, that water did mix. Really? Well, what you did was turn the heat up. And it got up to about 130 degrees. That's usually what you cook your soup to. And then all of a sudden, you get this visual illusion. You thought fat and water actually mixed. But what happens if you turn off the heat and you leave that pot on that stove? Doesn't that layer of fat rise right back to the top? Fooled you. Fat and water will never mix. It's like Hatfields and McCoys have been dueling from the beginning of time. They will never mix. Okay. So let's say while that pot of soup is still hot, Rebecca, you scoop a little bit and you slurp it down and it goes into your plasma. Hey, what's your body temperature? Normal body temperature? Linda knows. So, well, centigrade, but 98.6 Fahrenheit, right? All right, she got centigrade, <laughs> which is okay. So, so it goes into your body, 98.6 Fahrenheit, 130 degrees on the pot, 98.6 of your body. Is that colder or hotter? Is that cooler or hotter? 130 on the pot, 98.6 in your body. It's colder. Now you don't have that temperature to break the bonds anymore. So that means as soon as that fat droplet gets into your plasma, it says, ah, plasma, water, ah, where am I going to go? Oh, I can't stand, oh, where am I going to stand? Ah, ah, finds the next closest layer of fat. You know where that closest layer of fat is found? The wall of the endothelium, the wall of your blood vessels. You know what that's called? Fatty streak. The beginning of atherosclerosis. So that's why January, by the time you guys read your books about uh, atherosclerosis and the coronary artery disease, folks, I already saw it in chapter one. That if you eat too much fat, that if you have hypercholesterolemia, if you have too much fat in your body for any reason, it's going to hug the vascular wall, whether you like it or not. Everybody understand? All right. 
Let me see, who, who's doing bars two? May, you're doing bars two, aren't you? Yeah, May. Oh, you know, I got a question. It's a, I remember a, a surgeon asking me this a while back. I want to use it to make a point. Let's say you do a cholecystectomy on a 50-year-old obese female with for gallstones. When you cut through her anterior abdominal wall, you sew her back up after the surgery. What layer of the anterior abdominal wall will take the longest to heal and therefore is the most susceptible to infection? You know, the anterior abdominal wall has all those layers to it. And I wonder which layer takes the longest to heal. I think Joseph knows which one it is. I think Frank knows which one it is. Why is the adipose layer, Frank? What's that? Uh, adipose means what again? Uh, adipose means fat, does it not? And Frank, what does fat hate more than anything else? Thank you, baby! That's how they ask you the exact same thing on boards, too. But you don't know where they got that information from. Guess what? If you knew the basics, you answer the question. That's the point, is to keep asking it to you in a different context so that you don't think that it's the same question over and over again. Why do you think meningitis is such a deadly disease since your brain is 95% fat? Why do you think mastitis is such a bad disease since the breast is 95% fat? Why do you think testicular infections are so bad? Because your testes are 95% fat. I got to break it down, man. You got to see the connections. All right, so hydrophobic and hydrophilic, very important. There's more to it than just memorizing a definition is what I'm showing you, okay? A lot to it. All right, so here's the membrane. Fat soluble is on the inside, and then water soluble will be outside. But outside could be out here facing plasma or out here facing the cytoplasm. Everybody follow me? You understand, Cammy? You understand, PJ? All right, you with me, Chris? Cool. So that means the rule about fat soluble inside, water soluble outside is the rule unless you're talking about a transmembrane protein. But what I'm saying is physiology does not change. The use of the word in and out start to change. Let's say you got a sodium channel like this. Sodium channel goes through the membrane. Everybody follow? Well, sodium's got to go through this channel. Sodium is dragging water. That means if water and sodium has to go through here, so that means the water-soluble things have to be in here. Everybody follow that? So the use of the word in and out have to flip. So if you're talking about a transmembrane protein, water-soluble now is inside, fat-soluble is outside. But physiology did not change, did it, Janice? Fat is still in contact with fat, water is still in contact with water. Because in here in the channel, water-soluble. So that means water-soluble has to go through here. Out here, this is the membrane. That means fat is sitting on fat now. Everybody understand that? So let's say, Nicole, they ask you, where would you find lysine on a receptor, inside or outside? That means you have to remember, a receptor sticks outside of the membrane like that. So where would you find lysine? All you got to do is remember, is lysine charged or neutral? Charged. So where would you find it, inside or outside? Where? It's got to be outside in contact with water. Do you understand? The key is if they say a receptor, then the receptor sticks out. That means you have to say all charged molecules will be out here. The fat soluble molecules will be in here, inside the membrane. Does everybody understand that? Okay? Whereas if you're talking about a sodium channel, January, where would lysine be, inside or outside? Inside. Everybody understand? Because inside now is where water will be going through. Everybody understand that? Joseph, you understand that? Sandeep, you understand? Diana? Okay, very important that you understand it rather than just memorize in and out because they'll flip it. Again, they'll say uh, sodium channel, chloride channel, potassium channel. And then you got to remember, if we're talking about a channel, that's transmembrane. That means water soluble has to be inside now, okay? Everybody understand that? However, Andre, the way they're going to ask you on your boards to make it sound more crazy is to say, well, where would you find a lysine residue in a parathyroid hormone receptor of the osteoclast and the right tibial bone in somebody who's got osteopetrosis. Thank you very much. Everybody understand? All that extra information is just to throw you the heck off. And then after a while, you don't even know what question they're asking you anymore. You're busy trying to think about osteopetrosis. The question that had nothing to do with osteopetrosis. 
Okay? You got to know how to undress the question. Just get right there down to the bare question. Answer that and leave everything else alone. Uh, Brendan. No, lysine has an extra positive charge. Yeah, it doesn't matter whether it's positive or negative. If you charge, you drag water. So that means for a receptor that sticks out, then water soluble will be out here. So you say lysine will be outside. Okay? Again, that's how they make it sound more specific, Brendan, for on the exam. They pick an amino acid residue. They pick a glucose residue. They, that kind of stuff. And then I'll be illustrating that to you over and over again. So if you look at fat-soluble compounds, therefore, Kathy, fat-soluble compounds do not interact with the outer cell membrane. You understand that, Kathy? They go right through the membrane since the membrane is fat. Does that make sense to you, Kathy? All right. They go right through and they head for the nucleus because they have nuclear membrane receptors. You understand, Kathy? All right. Concentration gradient, therefore, Maria, becomes the only limiting factor. Does that make sense to you? Which means, Maria, if I have 10 molecules on this side, let's say this is the wall here, the membrane right here. I got 10 molecules on the left side. How many molecules will make it to the right side? Huh? 10? What do you think, Michelle? Five. Uh, what do you think, Elvis? Why five, Michelle? All right, so if you equilibrate, why do they stop moving? But how come you say they stop when you go to five and five? Okay, because once you lose your concentration gradient, folks, there is no more net movement. Does everybody understand? Because that's how they're asking on the boards. And that's how I illustrate it. Usually if somebody says, well, it depends on how many molecules are on the other side. If I didn't mention it, don't you bring it up. On the test, if they don't bring it up, you don't bring it up. Students are always wondering what's on the other side of the wall. Who cares what's on the other side of the wall? They didn't bring it up. That means if I tell you there's 10 sodiums over here, tell me five are going across. Does everybody understand me? Don't worry about the potassium on the other side. The chlorine. On the test, they'll tell you how many chlorides are on the other side, how many potassium. On the other. That's just to throw you off. Concentration gradients are independent of each other. It's electrical gradients that can be affected by the other one. That's why it's very important that when they ask you about concentration gradient, who cares what's on the other side? Does everybody understand? You understand, Chris? You understand, PJ? That's right, PJ's the man. Steroid hormones are a good example, PJ, of fat-soluble compounds. So let's use them, use them to illustrate. You understand? So for a steroid hormone, PJ, they're made from cholesterol. That makes them fat-soluble. Do you understand so far? That means they do not interact with the cell membrane. That means they go right through the cell membrane. They're heading for the nucleus, for the nuclear membrane receptors. You understand? All except one guy. His name is cortisol. His receptor is in the cytoplasm. But when he binds it, still slides over to the nuclear membrane. That means all in all, Nicole, all steroid hormones have a nuclear membrane receptor. Do you understand? Well, when they bind that receptor, Tara, they will affect DNA synthesis, replication, transcription, and translation into a protein via which they manifest their action. You understand, PJ? You understand, Tony? Well, I don't know if you understand, Tony, so I'm going to do it one more time for you, man. So let's say steroid hormones, they're all made from cholesterol. That makes them fat-soluble. Fat soluble means they don't have to interact with the outer cell membrane. That means they go right on through, Tony. Where are they heading for? The nucleus. Why? Because they got nuclear membrane receptors there. All except one guy. Who's that? Cortisol. Where's his receptor? In the cytoplasm. But when he binds it, still slides over this nuclear membrane. That means all in all, all steroid hormones will bind a nuclear membrane receptor. There they will affect DNA synthesis, replication, transcription, or translation into a protein via which they manifest their action. You understand what I said, Melanie? I don't know if you understood, Melanie, so I'm going to do it one more time just for you, because you're my friend. All right, so steroid hormones are made of what? Cholesterol. Is that fat or water soluble? Fat soluble, do they interact with the outer membrane? No, they go right on through. Where are they headed for? Nucleus. Where do, what are they going to bind? Nuclear membrane receptors, all except one guy. Who's that? Cortisol, where's his receptor? And when he binds it, it slides over to where? To the nuclear membrane, where they're going to stimulate DNA synthesis, replication, transcription, and translation, Tim into a, a protein via which they will manifest their action. You understand what Melanie just shared with me, Al? All right, Al, I don't know. You better repeat it one more time so the class can understand it. Weakness and shortness of breath. Weakness and shortness of breath. <laughs> 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 All right, so Al, if you got a steroid hormone, it's made of what? Cholesterol. Cholesterol, is that fat or water soluble? Fat. Fat soluble means does it interact with the outer cell membrane? No. no, it goes right on through, headed for where? Nucleus. Nucleus, what's going to bind there? Nuclear member receptor, all except whom? 
Cortisol, who has receptor where? In the cytoplasm. When he binds it, where's it going to go? To the nuclear membrane, where they're going to stimulate the interimplication, transcription, and translation into a protein via which they manifest their action. Jenny, do you understand all that? Eros, did you understand all that? Nicole, did you understand all that? Well, Eros, if you understood everything you just heard four times, you tell me what is the clear difference between one steroid hormone and another? Only one. Nope. Miguel, if I gave you 10 steroid hormones, there's really only one difference between each one of them. What would that be, Miguel? If you heard everything you just if you heard it clearly. What's that? Oh, no, there is something. January. Well, they all have that. Melanie. The protein. Notice at the end, I always say into a protein via which they manifest their action. That means, Chris, you heard endocrinology yesterday. I heard the protein, which means for steroid hormones, folks, if they ask you a question about one of them, if you don't find the answer with the protein, you're wasting your time. What do I mean? That means if you ask me about aldosterone, I said, well, the protein that comes out when aldosterone is working is sodium, potassium, plum. I scan with my eyes. How many answers have sodium, potassium, plum? Oh, only one. Thank you. Click next question. You asked me about vitamin D. I said, what protein comes out when vitamin D is working? Oh, calcium binding protein. I said, how many answers have calcium binding protein? Oh, one. Click next question. Folks, you've got to know how to organize your knowledge. Organize knowledge. When everything's the same, that's not going to get you a point. Everything's the same. It's not going to get you a point on the test. You got to know which one are they talking about. Because when the patient comes in, you got to decipher which one is causing them, their, the, causing them their problems. That's why they want you to know this. Because the protein that seems to be elevated tells me which hormone is causing this problem. You understand, Fazzle? You understand, Rebecca? You understand, Linda? All right. What about water soluble hormones, Michelle? Well, water soluble hormones, Michelle, are hydrophilic. That means they like water. Because they like water, they can't just go through the membrane, which is mostly fat. That's why they have to have a receptor on the outside. Everybody understand that? Well, that means if you bind a receptor on the outside, how do I get the signal on the inside? That's why they all require a second messenger. You understand, Diana? You understand, Sandeep? So that means, Sandeep, anytime they're talking about a second messenger, what kind of hormone are we talking about? Water soluble. Everybody understand that? Anytime you read a, a statement about DNA and RNA, what kind of hormone are they talking about, Sandeep? DNA and RNA? Steroid. That's how I switched up on you just to make sure you catch it now. Be careful. Listen carefully. Same thing with the test. Read carefully. That means any question with DNA and RNA, you better know it's a steroid hormone or vice versa. If they ask me about a steroid hormone, I can find the answer much quicker by looking for the protein. If I don't see it, look for DNA and RNA. You see that? This way you just moves backwards slowly till you get to the best answer. The best answer is the one that connects the quickest to the answer. Okay, protein first, DNA and RNA second. Okay, all right, so what are type of hormones require second messengers? Well, that's just the hormones. Let's just first focus on all water soluble hormone, water soluble proteins, period. You understand, Andre? All right, Andre, the number one factor that affects movement of all particles is what? No. Uh, Tamir, the number one factor that affects the movement of all particles is called what? It's called concentration gradient. If you got 10 molecules here, five will go across. Tamir, your question is? Um, so about that, because before you said that it doesn't depend on that, it depends on the, you said concentration gradient is the only limiting factor? Yeah, for fat soluble particles. Oh, fat soluble. Yeah. Okay. And otherwise, electrical. No, no, no. I say electrical plays a role, but that's only for water soluble stuff. Concentration is the main one. Concentration is the main one for everybody, period. For fat soluble, it's the only one. For water soluble, we're about to look at all the other things that can also affect this movement. Okay, my question was, when you mentioned uh, the protein makes a difference, that's how you know and the question was. Yeah, the best answer should have that protein in it. So what specifically can help to give an example? That's what I just gave you. Aldosterone, sodium potassium pump, okay. vitamin D, calcium binding protein. Yeah, that's how you locate the best answer. Okay? All right, so water soluble compounds, period. Chuku. Concentration gradient is the first most important principle of all movement. You understand? You understand, Chukuma? You understand, Jenny? You understand, Diana? 
Concentration gradient. So if 10 particles come to a membrane, how many would get across potentially? Diana. Mm. Sandeep. Five. Do you understand concentration gradient? Concentration gradient says when you have the same number on both sides, there will be no net movement. There's five and five. There's nothing to drive it to one side. So if I say 10 come, you say five go across. You follow me? You understand, Sandeep? You understand, Mustafa? You understand, ooh, James? You understand, James? You understand, Frank? To the left of Frank. Um, what's the first letter? Oh, okay. <laughs> and is Anita. Okay. <laughs> All right, so concentration gradient is the first principle of all movement. Everybody clear about that? All right, then size of molecule plays a role, Tamir, because now you're talking about uh, water-soluble particles. The more charge it has, the more water is dragging. Do you understand? The size of the molecule, the bigger it is, the harder it is to get across. Do you understand that? All right, the net charge makes a difference. One charge versus three charges. Three drags more water along with it. Do you understand? All right, pH will make a difference now, Tamir, because pH will affect how much charge you have on you. But right now, here's what I want you to understand. As you raise the pH, as you raise the pH, an acid gains charge, Tara. As you raise the pH, Omar, an acid gains charge. A base loses charge. Right then, V? COOH goes to CO minus, right? All right, we'll learn more about that in biochemistry. For right now, I just want you to know the trend. As you raise the pH, an acid gains more charge. That means it drags more water, less likely to go across. You understand, Tamir? All right. The thickness of the membrane will play a role, Tamir, because if the membrane is thick, it's harder to get across. You understand? All right. Surface area of the membrane will play a role, Tamir. The more surface area, the easier it is to get across. The less the, sur the, 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 less the surface area, the harder it is to get across. Does that make sense to you? That's why they have, in every building, they want at least two exits. Why? That's more surface area for people to get out in case there's a fire. If there's only one exit, that's very little surface area. That means very few people get through that membrane. You understand? I told you it works at the, even at the macro level, man. All right, then there's flux, Tamir. Flux, movement of particles over time, dx over dt. Flux, the more flux, the more likely you are to get across. Does that make sense to you, Tamir? All right, that means if hardly anything's moving towards the memory, hardly anything's going to get across. And then finally, Tamir, we got something called reflection coefficient. Look at the equation. At the bottom, the number of particles you sent towards the membrane. At the top, the number of particles that return back to you. So, Tamir, if I send 10 particles and nobody came back, so you got 0 over 10. That's a, a reflection coefficient of 0. You understand? All right? If I send 10 particles and all 10 came back, then that's 10 over 10. So that's a reflection coefficient of 1. So that means it's between 0 and 1. Everybody understand that? All right. There is no perfect 0. There is no perfect 1 either. So it's always somewhere between point, you know, 0, 1 to 0. 0.99. Everybody understand me? Everybody understand so far? So, Diana, if I give you a reflection coefficient of 0. 0.9, is that high or low? That's high. Does that mean most of them went, went across the membrane or most of them came back to me? No, no, look at the equation. The bottom is the number of particles I sent towards the membrane. The top is the number of particles that came back to me. If I say 0.9, that means 9 out of 10 came right back to me. Does that mean the majority went across or the majority came back to me? Speak up. The majority did what? They came back to me. Does that make them fatter water soluble, Diana? I thought fat soluble goes across the membrane with no problem. You understand? Now focus only on water soluble now to answer my questions. You understand that? A point nine means nine came right back, which means hardly anybody went across. That means it's mostly water soluble. Do you understand that? You understand? So follow me now. So what does that tell you about the concentration gradient? High or low?
if the particle is mostly water soluble, is that a good thing or a bad thing, Diana? For crossing membrane. If it's water soluble, is that a good thing or a bad thing for getting across a membrane? If you are water soluble, is that a good thing or a bad thing for getting across a membrane? Mm. The membrane is mostly fat. You understand now? You understand? If you have fat, water will be repelled. Fat hates water, water hates fat. You understand that? So that means if I tell you that it's a point 0.9, is that mostly fat or water soluble? Mostly water soluble. So now you concentrate on water solubility and answer my question. What does that tell you about the concentration gradient if hardly anybody went across? Is it high or low? It has to be low. Do you understand? Focus on the water solubility. What does that tell you about the size of the molecule, large or small, if hardly anybody went across? It's got to be large. Net charge on the molecule, is it high or low if hardly anybody got across? It's got to be high. The pH, is this most likely to be an acid or a base if hardly anybody got across? It's got to be an acid. What does that tell you about the thickness of the membrane? Is that membrane thick or thin if hardly anybody got across? Must have been thick. What about the surface area, large or small? If hardly anybody got across. It must be small. What about the flux, high or low, if hardly anybody got across? No, flux is moving towards the membrane. So if hardly anybody got across, there's hardly any flux. Do you understand? All right. We don't, we don't allow no giving up here at the past program, babe. You can shake your head all you want. You're still going to answer my questions. All right. So, <laughs> so Janice, if I give you a reflection coefficient of 0.8, is that high or low to you? That's high. Does that make that fat or water soluble? Water soluble. What's that tell you about the concentration gradient? High or low? Must have been low. Size of molecule, large or small. Charge on it, high or low? The amount of flux, high or low? And the pH, is it more acid or base? Acid surface area, high or low? And thickness of the membrane, thin or thick? Everybody understand? Tina. Let's push it a little further. If I give you a 0.1, is that high or low? That's low. Does that make it fat or water soluble? Yeah. Must be fat soluble. Concentration gradient, high or low? High. Size of molecule, large or small? Is it likely to be an acid or base? Net charge, large or small? Is it thickness of the membrane, thick or thin? Surface area, large or small? Flux, high or low? Oh, wait a minute, you said, no, no, that's right, right, small, for thickness of the membrane and surface area. Oh, no, surface area, that's why I, that didn't click for right. Surface area should be large, yeah, thickness of the membrane should be thin, okay. I want to make sure we didn't mess up there. And then, uh, what was the last one, flux? Hi. Flux? High, because hardly everybody, uh, almost everybody went across. Everybody follow that? I don't know, Nicole, we better do it again. If I give you a point one, point one five. Is that high or low? As low as that fat or water soluble. Fat soluble, co concentration gradient, high or low? Concentration gradient, high or low? If you said fat soluble, I mean, if most of them got across, is the concentration gradient high or low? High. It's got to be high if most of them got across. You understand? All right. Size of particle, large or small? Small, is the particle charged or uncharged? Is it more likely to be an acid or base? Surface area, large or small? Small, thickness of the membrane, thick or thin? Thin, flux, high or low? High. No, the, oh, no, no, surface area is, is high for this one. Oh, did she misspeak? Excuse me? No, of the membrane, of the membrane. If you got a lot of surface area, more will get across, right? All right, so I don't know if you really understand what you just learned. So let's take it to another level. Miguel, if I got a point 0.1, is that high or low? Fat or water soluble? Fat soluble. Is that hard or easy to absorb? 
Easy. Your GI is just another membrane to me. Can it get into your skin? Can it get into your pancreas? Can it get into your muscle? Can it cross a blood-brain barrier? What's the volume distribution, high or low? What's that half-life going to be, long or short? Huh? Yeah, it's stuck all over your body now. That's, that's going to be a long half-life. CNS toxicity risk, high or low? High. What organ is going to metabolize it, liver or kidney? The liver, so it's going to be hepatonephrotoxic. Hepatotoxic, is it going to depend on GFR P450? <laughs> yes, but it's not on the list, Miguel. I said GFR P450. You guys do these writing campaigns. I, they give you two choices, you put in a third one. I don't know where you're getting this answer from. GFR P450. P450. Does everyone understand what Miguel just did? How is it that Miguel just told me all that without reading anything? Because we've just connected. Wait a minute, Eros. Let me take it to another level and show you what you just learned. You guys aren't getting it, man. This is only the beginning. If I tell you that a drug has a long half-life, Eros, is that a fat or water-soluble drug? Fat. fat soluble, larger or small particle? Acid or base? Hard or easy to absorb? Can it get into your skin? Can it get into your brain? How about your pancreas? How about your muscles? Volume of distribution, high or low? High. And where's it going to be metabolized, liver or kidney? Liver. Is it going to be hepatonephrotoxic? Hepato. Depend on GFR P450. Thank you. Let me show you one more time what you just learned. If I tell you short half-life is less than six hours, long half-life, more than 12 hours, you should be able to rewrite the PDR without ever looking it up. Do you understand, Diana? So let's say I give you a statin drug, Diana, and you take it once a day. Is that a long or short half-life? Long half-life, does that make it fat or water soluble? Fat soluble. Does that make it hard or easy to absorb? Mm, you say fat soluble can cross any membrane it likes. You understand? That means that remember, focus only on fat soluble. Once you connect to one, I want to hear it go all the way through. You shouldn't have to rethink it for the next one. All right, so if you say fat soluble, that means it's easy to absorb. Can it get into your skin? Can it get into your pancreas? Into your muscle? Into your brain? The risk of CNS toxicity, high or low? What's the volume distribution, high or low? If it be high, where's it going to be metabolized? Liver or kidney? Mmm, fat soluble goes to the liver. Water soluble goes to the kidney. Remember, you pee water, you pee water out. Okay? You understand? So that means is it going to be hepatonephrotoxic? Hepatotoxic. It's going to depend on GFR or P450. GFR or P450. Which one does it depend on? Mmm, you're in the liver. You're in the liver. See, now, once you get nervous, your mind goes blank. That's why the question sounds new again. Don't let, it, don't let the mind do that. Stay calm. Once you connect to fat soluble, I want to hear the rest because that goes with fat soluble. You shouldn't have to rethink it for the next set of questions. Uh, Jay? Uh, what was the time line for the, the short Less than six hours. Yeah, six or less is short half-life. Twelve or more is long half-life. So, Paul! You take prednisone once a day. Is that a long or short half-life? Is that fat or water soluble? Is that a large or small particle? Hard or easy to absorb? Can it get into your skin? Get into your pancreas? Get into your bones? Get into your muscle? Can it get into your brain? CNS toxicity risk, high or low? Uh, volume distribution, high or low? It's going to be high, huh? So where's it going to be metabolized, liver or kidney? In the liver, so it's going to be hepatonephrotoxic. It's going to be hepatotoxic. It's going to depend on GFR P450. P450! Folks, check it out. Tell me one thing about a drug, I'll tell you the whole PDR after that. That's what you just learned. That's what you just learned. Let me tell you, give you an example. You guys memorize something called RIPS, R-I-P-S. Is that the drug that causes myositis, hepatitis? Did you notice that all four drugs are given once a day? No, you didn't, did you? 
Do you notice why I would tell you who's the longest acting drug every time we do a family? Do you notice why I tell you who's the shortest acting drug every time we do a family? So that means January, if I told you that flu fluorazepam is the longest acting benzodiazepine, is that fat or water soluble? Is it a large or small particle? Yeah. More likely to be an acid or base. Hard or easy to absorb? Yeah. Can it get into your skin? Yeah. Get into your pancreas? Yeah. Get into your bones? Yeah. Get into your muscles? Yeah. Get into your brain? Yeah. See this toxicity, high or low? Where's it going to be metabolized? Liver or kidney? Yeah. Is it hepatonephrotoxic? Yeah. GFRP 450. Yeah. Tell me one more time, January. Who would you avoid that drug in? Okay, if you know the drug is real fat soluble, Tara, who would you avoid that drug in? People with liver problems. Who would you avoid that drug in? There it is. Cammy's got one. Obese patients. And what about elderly? Because as you age, your body's mostly fat. Oh, folks, give me some elbow room up in here. <laughs> you be reading PDRs for what reason? For what reason? Why don't you learn how the PDR is written? We've already learned how to figure out signs and symptoms, effects and side effects. Now I'm telling you the pharmacokinetics without ever having to look it up. I can tell you who can cause you a rash. CNS toxicity, nephrotoxicity, hepatotoxicity. Just tell me how many times a day you're giving it. I'll tell you. Rather than you reading, oh, ampicillin is a drug of choice for UTI. If it's a drug of choice for UTI, Sandeep, is it fat or water soluble? I said ampicillin is a drug of choice for UTI. So does that make it fat or water soluble? Water soluble, large or small particle? Uh, hard or easy to absorb? Can it get into your skin? Get into your brain? Get into your muscles? How about your pancreas? How about your bones? Long or short half-life? Short half-life? So it's going to be hepatonephrotoxic. That's why I go straight to the kidney, baby. That's how I know the drug of choice. Not because some expert has to write it down for me. Because I understand the physiology of these things. That's how I know. That's how I know, folks. Otherwise, you always got to pull an article. Drug of choice for this, drug of choice for that, drug of choice for that. You got to know how they figured it out so that you can think it through, figure it out for yourself before an, uh, an expert even has to write it down for you. You'll know it. You'll be a way ahead of any expert. That way your knowledge is not limited to only what you've read. That's all you know, nothing else. That's why the, every new test writer can write a new test question and fool you again if that's all you know is what you've read. You got to see how to expand your knowledge. So that means all they have to do is tell you how many times a, a day the drug is given. You should be able to tell me everything else. So Tina. So that means if I tell you, let's see, what's the other one I gave you? Uh, let's see, alprazolam. I told you it was the shortest acting benzo. Is that fat or water soluble? I said shortest acting benzo. It's got to be water soluble. Is that a large or small particle? Large, acid or base? Charge or uncharged? No, no, sorry. I thought you were asking me was. <laughs> If it's charged, it's got to be an acid. Remember I said an acid gains more charge as the pH goes up. Your pH is 7.4. So it's already got lots of charge as soon as it comes in. All right? So if that happens, what's going to happen to the volume distribution? It's going to be high or low? Right. Can it get into your skin? That's the one you were doing now. Focus only on what you're doing. That's it. You said water soluble. That means now I'm asking you a question about the same molecule. So it can't get into your skin. Can it get into your bone, brain, CNS toxicity risk, high or low? Low. Is it going to be hepatonephrotoxin? Okay. So if I ask you now, management may, for that same drug that's short acting, if you want to make sure that you can get rid of this drug, what's the most important thing you have to I have to advise your patient. Excuse me? I can't hear you? Drink a lot of water. How do you know that? 
Because it has to go straight to the kidney, doesn't it? Oh, my goodness. Is that why all throughout the PDR, they always say maintain adequate hydration? Oh, folks, I got to enlighten you, man. You guys are reading the same thing 10,000 times when you could have figured out one time. And now you know it for all the drugs in the PDR. Any short acting, folks, we know everything about it. Any long acting, we know everything about it, too. The ones who are intermediate, half and half. <laughs> Check it out. Check it out, man. Done. PDR. Explain, baby. You can't read that fast, man. Oh, man, we just getting started. This is smooth stuff. Uh, first letter, man. Josh. All right, Josh. Obese, elderly, and, you know, small babies, because they're mostly fat, too. Yeah, it goes into adipose tissue. It won't come out. It doesn't work there either. I mean, it just sits there. But that means it's going to leak out slowly for weeks. <laughs> and uh, weeks later or days later, they, the person is still sedated on your florezepam. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's not what you want. <laughs> yes. What about pregnant women? That's just a membrane to me. <laughs> that's correct. <laughs> see? You're figuring it out. That's what I'm telling you. Once you see the concept, look at that. You understand all the details without my telling you. You can see it for yourself now. Uh, Sak Chai. No, I mean, wh what I'm saying is, what does that tell you about the concentration gradient that you have? It means you don't have enough concentration gradient for, it to get, for more particles to get across. That's just the conclusion you can make about concentration gradient. Not that it reflects exactly what your concentration, concentration gradient is. Because 9 came back, which means you need a much bigger concentration gradient if you want to get 5 of them to get across. It means your concentration gradient was not enough. That's why nine came back. Only one went across. Well, you need a bigger concentration gradient. Now, Sock Chai, tell me what is the most important factor that governs the movement of all particles? Thank you. So that means if everything else goes wrong, Sock Chai, how do I overcome it, man? Let's say the membrane is too thick, the particle is too large, too charged, too acidic. How can I still get it to go across? Cammy will tell you. Mm, no, nope. close though, sock tie. No, Josh. Increase the concentration gradient. Does everybody see that? Does everybody understand that as of this day? I don't care how many other factors went wrong, if you still want a particle to get across. Increase the concentration gradient. You understand the code? You understand Tanvi? You understand Rashmi? Do you truly understand Rashmi? Do you see what I see? Do you see through the eyes of physio how powerful it is? That's how I know when a baby's got ARDS, fibrosis, thick membrane, molecules too large, having a hard time getting across like oxygen. How do we treat ARDS? Give more oxygen? Folks, that's the big picture. That was in chapter one. But well, nobody told you that's where they got it from. But no, when you get the ARDS, when you get inflammatory bowel disease, all of a sudden, you, you, they ask you about management. You have no idea because you think it's something new. The GI is just another membrane. The lungs, when we get the anesthesia, another membrane. The neuro, blood brain barriers, another membrane. The kids, are you going to remember that or are you going to swear we're on a new topic and then I got to teach you something else? We just covered it. We just covered all of it. Okay, we roll. Fix equations. Now, if I wrote the equation up here, you guys would write it down, and then it means nothing anymore. So what I did, I left it off, and I'm going to show you how easy it is because I'm telling you that Linda is going to tell you the equation. All Fick did is said all the things that promote diffusion, put it in a numerator. That means when they rise, diffusion rises. Everybody understand? All the things that 
impaired diffusion, put it in the denominator. That means when they rise, diffusion decreases. Everybody understand what I just said? You understand, Thomas? You understand, RJ? You understand, Matt? You understand, Diana? You understand, uh, Mark? Lucas? All right, so Linda, go to work. Concentration gradient, do I put it in the top or the bottom? Put it at the top, size of the molecule, top or the bottom? Huh? Now, now I want you to think it through now. I don't want you to guess, well, if it's not top, it's got to be bottom. I want you to make sure you see the physio. How, the molecule is big, it's going to have a hard time getting across. Do you understand? You got to put it down in the bottom then. Because that means as the size rises, diffusion decreases. You understand now? All right, net charge, top or bottom? Bottom. pH. Now, pH, if you look at the equation, he puts pH in parentheses, top or bottom, because it could be either one. So if it's an acid, would you put the pH at the bottom or at the top? At the bottom. And then if it's for a base, pH would be at the top. Everybody understand that now, right? All right. Thickness of the membrane, Linda, top or bottom? Bottom. Surface area of the membrane, top or bottom? Top. Flux, top or bottom? Top. Reflective coefficient, top or bottom? Yes, yeah, bottom. Because remember, the higher the reflective coefficient, that means very little went across. All right? So that's how you duplicate fixed equation, folks, without guessing. I don't want you guys to just write down an equation that has no meaning to you. Because on the board, the way they're going to ask you, well, what would happen to diffusion if you were to double this, uh, quadruple this, and cut this one in half? It sounds complex, but if you know... What goes on the top, what goes on the bottom? You put the, you know, one-third up here, one-half down here, or whatever. And then if it's still a fraction, diffusion decreased. If it's a whole number, diffusion went up. That's it. Okay? So that's why I want you to just memorize. All right? So that's fixed equation. Other functions of a membrane, create and maintain a concentration gradient. In order to maintain a concentration gradient, you've got to have what we call selective permeability, PJ. That means you got to select who you allow to go across that membrane. You understand, Chris? You understand, Dan? All right. Within the membrane, Dan, we have saturated and unsaturated fats. Saturated fats, Dan, mean you have no double bond. That means it's all hydrogens everywhere. Unsaturated fats means you have double bonds. If you have double bonds, PJ, the question is, why do we like them? You know, when you hear the commercials, rich in polyunsaturated fats. But the average Joe doesn't even know what that means. It just sounds good. So, so they figure, well, if they're saying it on a commercial, I mean, I, I better go, go, go get some of that butter. Rich in polyunsaturated fats. Okay, let's understand why you need the unsaturated fats. Number one, if it's unsaturated, it's easier to break down. So we say, well, if you're going to be fat with fat, be fat with unsaturated fats because it's easier to break down when you get ready to break it down. Everybody understand that? A double bond is already strained, which means it's easier to break it the rest of the way. You understand, Chris? You understand, Dan? Unsaturated fats, easy to break down. Number two, better temperature regulation. You understand, Dan? All right, Dan, here's what I mean. If you got saturated fats, no double bonds, they line up perfectly like this. That means now there's no gap in here. That means if you, your cells are doing respiration, you know, oxidative phosphorylation, all that stuff, they're generating heat. You understand? You got to let the heat get out. If the membrane is sealed like this tightly, the heat can't escape. You understand that? What's going to happen to your body temperature? It's going to go up. You understand that? Okay. But if I got an unsaturated fat, it's got a double bond. Every time you put a double bond in it, it creates a kink. See that? That means there's a little hole in here now. All these little holes throughout the membranes allow heat to escape whenever your body needs it to escape. You understand Al? You understand Linda? You understand Rebecca? So, better temperature regulation. You understand, Rashmi? You understand it now, Dan? So that means if you have nothing but saturated fats, you're going to have a hard time regulating your temperature, aren't you? Dan, what's going to happen to your body temperature? It's going to go up. Wait a minute, Dan. There's some clinical application of this, man. Tell me what I got to do. Break it down. I got to break it down one time, man. Don't you know, folks? That's why when you're overweight, you sweat for no doggone reason. That's why diabetics sweat for no doggone reason. That's why people with hypercholesterolemia sweat for no doggone reason. 
Why does a newborn baby generate so much heat? Why is it you can keep him out in the cold on the doorsteps of the convent? He's still warm the very next morning because he's got number of saturated fats everywhere, baby. Check it out. Why do you think after you eat a big, fat, juicy steak, all of a sudden you got sweat across your forehead? I got to break it down for you, man. Saturated fats keep the heat inside. That means your body's got to make you sweat to get rid of that heat now. You don't have the hose anymore. Look at that. Ooh. All right. The third thing, there's more fluidity. So let's pretend that screen is a membrane. Four sides. That means we're going to pretend 25% of everything is done on each side. You understand, Nelson? You understand, Tamir? So let's say you scrape up against a piece of glass and cut an artery to one side. That means now you only have three sides to work with. You understand, Frank? You understand, Jennifer? If you only have three sides, that means that cell can only maintain 75% of its needs. You understand that? That cell's going to die. Typically, once you drop below 90% of your needs, you're in trouble. Okay? That cell will die. That means every time you get a small cut, you can lose your whole hand if that were to happen. So you know what happens? Let's say you lose the blood supply to the bottom. All the proteins on the bottom, channels, receptors, everything, they start doing this. And then they come to this side. And they lock it right here. That means this side is now doing 50, 25, 25. Nothing going on down here. That's what they mean by lateral movement. The books always just say, oh, lateral movement. Of course, when I read it my first year, I had no idea what that meant. I mean, what I got to shift to the side? Why not the front and the back? You know, why is this side to side stuff? You know, but anyway, I had no idea what they were talking about. Lateral movement. Until I finally understood physiology. Oh, now I see. It just means shifting laterally to another side until that side is repaired. Then the other 25% will go back. That's why that cell maintains entire integrity until the blood supply returns and cells don't die. Otherwise, a small cut, you would lose so much of your hand if that were to happen, okay? All right, so the three benefits of unsaturated fats. Then we have essential fats, Maria. Essential fats mean you get it only from your diet. Essential fats, Ferdy, mean you get it only from where? From your diet. Wait a minute, Ferdy. Let's say you don't eat it in your diet. What cycle in your body can replace it for you? None. Does everybody understand that? But on the test, they love to ask it as a leading question in January to make you think there's supposed to be some cycle that can do it. Don't fall for that. Now, you got to make sure you always understand what they're asking you. Okay, so you don't just talk yourself into something. Essential, whether it's fatty acids, amino acids, or anything else, you have no cycle in your body that can replace it. That means if ever you cannot eat these in your diet, you're going to have a disease, period. Does everybody understand me? Anytime you're missing an essential, you will have a disease, guaranteed. Because your body then has to break itself down in order to find it because it can't make it. All right, linolenic and linoleic are the two they want you to know, Michelle. Linoleic, it's got that A sound in it. It's used to make A for arachidonic acid. Very important. They love to ask you about that one. So that means, Diana, for strict vegetarians who don't eat any fat at all, you got to know their problem. Because arachidonic acid, as we're going to learn in biochemistry, is used to make prostaglandins and leukotrienes. That means if you're a strict vegetarian, you're deficient in all of those. That means in biochemistry, when we talk about it, that's how you know all the problems they're going to have. Question, Lucas? Oh, okay, I thought. All right, so linolytic and linoleic. Other membrane functions, phagocytosis. Anytime, Jenny, we're talking about membrane movement. Remember I said it's going to require energy. Phagocytosis, movement of membranes, requires energy. It also requires calcium and microtubules. Membrane movement always requires calcium, microtubules, and ATP. That always goes without saying. All right. If you say endocytosis, Chris, bringing something in, number one thing is to bring in nutrition. Do you understand? So that means any question about endocytosis, Al, the best word to look for in the answer is what? Nutrition. Some kind of nutrient. That means before I read, folks, I scan. I scan with my eyes and say, who's got my word in it? If only one, that's called a freebie where I come from. I don't argue with the test writers about their details. I click, I move to the next question. Why? Because that answer is the right answer 95% of the time. You think I care about the other 5%? That's what I'm telling you. Stop worrying about the one or two times you're going to be wrong. 
Make sure you got your, mi your mind organized in high yield fashion, okay? So endocytosis is about nutrition. Exocytosis is primarily for pushing out garbage. That means all the lead your cells produce waste, don't they? That means they got to push it out. The most common waste all cells produce is lipofusion. Lipofusion is oxidized lipid and protein. Well, our lead, it turns out lipofusion has a nice brown color to it. Nice brown color. Hey, wait a minute, our lead. Didn't I say member movement requires energy? Didn't I say that? Well, as you age, our lead, what happens to your energy level? Goes down. Everybody understand that? You understand that, Sunday? You understand that, Nicole? So that means what happens to your ability to do exocytosis? It decreases. What happens to your ability to do endocytosis? Decreases. So you see, as you age, cells start to die because they can't even take in nutrition. See that? Chapter one, folks, chapter one. And then as you age, you can't push out this brown pigment. Hey, Cammy. As you age, what color are your cells going to start looking like? Brown. Brown? What color are age spots? Brown. What color is your liver as you age? Brown. What color is your heart as you age? What color is your spleen as you age? What color is your legs with chronic stasis dermatitis? Oh, gee. Is that where they got that from? Oh, folks, you better look it up. You better look it up. They've hidden, they've hidden a lot from you in medical school, man. The, contact, the concepts are there. But nobody tells you what the concepts are. They just tell you one disease after one disease after one disease. You don't realize you could apply it across all the diseases at one time. Get it all done. Yeah? Get her done, man. Get her done. <laughs> all right, so that's exocytosis. What about pinocytosis, Eros? Pinocytosis. Uh, let me go to the back row. Dahlia, pinocytosis is for movement of fluids and electrolytes. That means the membrane kind of wraps around fluids and electrolytes. You understand? Well, if a membrane wraps around fluids and electrolytes, we said earlier that a membrane has to be highly selective by what it allows to come in, right? If a membrane just wraps around fluids, do you know how much fluid is in here? They didn't count it. The membrane didn't count it. He has no idea how many molecules of water are in there. Does he know how much sodium is in there? No. Chloride? No. Potassium? No. Then you can't let membranes just do pinocytosis anytime they want. Well, Jennifer, it turns out there's one membrane that can drink using, its mem uh, using the membrane. One cell that can drink using its membrane, that's your skin. Because if we allowed every cell in your body to do that, chuku, those cells will swell up and die. Do you understand that? Do you understand, Jenny? Do you understand, Brendan? So that's why we can't let that happen. But we let the skin do this? Why? Well, allow me to illustrate, man. You know when you're in the shower in the tub, that water that comes out of the faucet has no electrolytes in it? That means it's pure gradient to go into your body. Your skin drinks. That's why when you're in the shower or in the tub, you feel nice and moist. Everybody follow me? But what happens when you step out of the shower? You ever wonder why you're, all that water evaporates real fast? Because the gradient goes the opposite direction now. Your skin dries out just like that. That's why we tell moms who have children with eczema, no more than one bath a day, because we already know what's going to happen. Everybody understand? Okay. How can I make your skin drink, though, Kathy is asking herself, Dr. Francis. You got all these powers down here in Champagne. Please make my skin drink. <laughs> no problem, babe. I'm going to make your skin drink. Give me your skin. Give me your hand. So let's say I want to make your skin drink. I, I pour some water on it. Oh, she got water, too. So I can just pour water on there. Okay. All right, skin drink. I don't hear no slurping, no sipping, no nothing. The skin's not listening to me. Thinks I'm not serious. Skin drink. Here's more water. I still don't hear no slurping, no nothing. I say, oh, my God. Oh. I say, oh, wait, wait, wait a minute. I learned some physio down in Champagne. I know how. Give me your skin again. This is just a membrane, right? If I pour water on that skin, what is it that water hates more than anything else, Sunday? Fat. What does fat hate more than anything else, Kathia? Water. So if I put this water on your skin, what if I put a layer of fat right over it? Will that water come this way? No, it's forced to go that way. What do you think moisturizing lotions are? Oh, what do you think a vino baths are? Oh, what do you think of all that fancy stuff you guys put in your bathtub? That, you know, women put all that oily stuff. You ever wonder why as soon as they pour that stuff, the baths are uh, uh, oily, oily with Avon. 
you see the oil film go over the top of the water. That's why then when you're in the water, the water goes into your skin. But then when you come out of the water, the fat, oily stuff goes right onto your skin right away. And guess what? That water won't come out anymore. That water goes in. It's forced to go inside. That's how you moisturize the skin. Because if you just try plain water, you dry out the skin even more. Simply because the water comes out of a faucet, has no electrolytes in it. The water goes in, comes right back out. That's why you look nice and moist and soft while you're in the shower. When you come out, you look like dried up prune. <laughs> 60 seconds later, because the water leaves you just as fast. Think about a newborn baby who's been bathing in water for nine months. Why do you think his skin dries out so fast after he's born? And then you see seborrhea, dry skin all over. Oh, folks, give me some elbow room up in this joint. Man. All right, other membrane functions. <laughs> Temperature regulation. Temperature regulation, Ferdy. Number one way. Well, there's three ways. Radiation is heat moving down a concentration gradient, Ferdy. That means the stove is more hot than your hand. So that means if you put your hand on that stove, the heat will transfer to your hand real fast. Concentration green, that's all it is. Let's say you go to a party, somebody comes off the dance floor, Melanie, and then they sit next to you like, hey, come on, man, move over. Now you got all that heat with you. That's because they've generated heat by dancing, and you're cooler. That's why since they sat down, that heat jumped right over to you. Concentration gradient, if you allow it to happen. Well, think about a hot day, Chris. On a hot day, the heat moves down into the street. You ever see those wavy lines on a hot day? You guys know what I'm talking about? Jennifer, you understand, Frank? You understand, Nita? All right, so on a hot day, Nita, you can see the heat moving into the street, can't you? On a cold day, which will heat move, Nita? Huh? On a cold day, which will heat move, in or out of the street? Out of the street. So on the next day, it becomes hot, which will heat move? Into the street. Then the next day, it becomes cold, which will heat move? Out. Then on the next day, it becomes real hot, Chris, which will heat move? Into the street. And then on the next day, it gets cold, which will heat move, Dan? Out. Whenever you have this hot, cold, hot, cold cycles that come so fast, he will want to move out of the street so fast on the next cold day, it'll come bursting out of there. You know what that's called? A pothole. See, when you walk through the streets of Chicago, what do you see? Potholes. I see is you. <laughs> that's the difference, man. Well, if you're in the ocean, the heat will move into the ocean, Tony. You understand? That means as I'm walking along the beach, if the water is absorbing the heat, is it going to be hotter or cooler right along the beach? Say that again. I'm next to the water. The water is absorbing the heat out of the air. Is it going to be hotter or cooler right here at the beach? That's why people run to the beach in the summertime, folks. Why is it cooler right by the water? Because the water is doing you a favor, absorbing the heat. And that's why when you get into the lake water, then it's warm. That's because it absorbed the heat out of the air for you. Turn around, sun deep on a cold winter day. On a cold winter day, I used to see the weatherman in Chicago, and the, the, the temperature was always like three or four degrees warmer along the lake than it was in the rest of the city a block away. Do you know why that is, Tony? Why is that? Because the water then lets the heat come back out on a cold day. I used to wonder, why are joggers running right along the lake? Oh, folks, and they were smarter than the rest of us. They knew it was warmer along the lake than even one block away. Because now one block away, the wind has a chance to take that same air and then cool it real fast. Just one block down, and wham, now you see why they call it the Windy City. Because now you got that freezing cold slap in your face. Just one or two blocks away, and it's freezing cold. And yet you see a jogger running right along the lake because it's warmer. I want you to see the physiology behind it. That's just radiation. All right, so that's radiation, moving to concentration gradient. What about conduction? Conduction, chukuma, requires contact with something. Conduction, when you put your hand on a stove, that's conduction because that's actually contact. So you got radiation and contact. Once you have contact, then we call it conduction. Everybody understand? You have to have contact with it. So that means, Melanie, same person comes off the dance floor, they sit so close to you that their arm touches yours, you really feel the heat because their body heat transfers over to yours real fast. Everybody understand? That's conduction. Well, when you go to bed, 
and you lay down on the sheet. That sheet conducts the heat out of your body. Does everybody understand me so far? You understand, Pranima? That sheet conducts heat out of your body. But then it takes about two hours. Your body equilibrates temperature with that sheet. So what do you do? You roll over. That's the reason why you roll over all night long. Conduction of the heat. Well, folks, why do you think people like cotton sheets? Because cotton conducts heat better than other materials. Why do you think those who are very wealthy like silk sheets? Because silk has even more fibers in it to suck the heat right out of your body. So it feels nice and cool all night long. Why do you think those who can afford it start buying the higher thread counts cotton sheets? Because that means there's more fibers in it to suck the heat out of your body. Now, they don't tell you that on QVC. They don't say nothing about that on HSN either. But that's the, that's the reason why people spend, you know, uh, the normal is like 180 count. But then also on 250 count, 600 count, they, they charge you a lot more money. But that's because when you sleep on one of those, oh, it just feels so cool, so soft, and you sleep so much better. Why? Because your body stays cool the whole night long. That's all it's about, folks. That's all it's about. Basic physiology. Mmm. What about convection? Convection, Jenny. Convection, Brandon, says the environment has to move past me. So that means when I'm walking like this, I feel cooler up here. Why? Because my body heat's left back here. When I walk over here, I feel cool over here. Why? Because my body heat's left over here. And then I walk this way. Why? Because the environment is sucking my heat and leaving it over there. Everybody understand that? That's why you take a walk in the evening. You take a walk in the afternoon. As long as you're in motion, you're cooler. Why do you think people ride their bike along the lake? Because you cool off even more. Why is it that when you're running, hardly any sweat coming off your forehead? The minute you stop, you sweat like a pig. Because as long as you were in motion, see that? You were cooling by convection. The minute you stop, you lost convection. Now your body uses conduction. And that means put sweat on your body and let the heat conduct through the water. See that? That's one of the questions they love to ask on the boards. Why do you sweat more when you stop jogging than when you were jogging? It's because you've lost convection. Mm -mm. Wait a minute, man. Why is it on a hot summer day? You roll down the window to the car so that the environment can suck the heat out of your car. Why is it a hot summer day? You stick your arm outside the car because that way convection can cool your body much faster. Why is it? The dog, the cat, stick their head out the window with the tongue hanging out. Because dogs and cats, they, they cool themselves off by panting the heat out. <laughs> and then they get in the car and they go right to the window <laughs> and just let convection take all the heat out of their body. That's why every time you put your pet in the car, they run straight to the window. They don't want you to sit. They want to go to the window because there it is. Why do you think a dog runs after a moving car, but not a car who's sitting still? Because a moving car brings back fond memories <laughs> <laughs> of how cool it is in that car. You see? Because if it was just about a car, folks, they'd run after a car that's standing still. But they only run after a car who's moving because the memory of how cool they feel when, that, when they're in that car. Canning. Yeah. Well, it's both. It's just that because you've lost convection, you have to use the other two. So your body will automatically radiate heat, but if there's sweat on your body, it also conduct heat. So you're using those two together. So it's forcing your body to sweat so it can conduct and radiate. Convection is the quickest and most powerful way to cool off. Why do you think we have a fan sitting next to us and blowing the air past us? That's the fastest way to cool yourself off. Why do you think you scoop a hot uh, a, a spoon of soup and start blowing on it? Because that's the quickest way to cool it off. Why do you think, James, if you drink that soup and it's hot, <laughs> you start doing that? That's called convection. It's the most powerful way to cool yourself off. 
Why do you think air conditioning systems in the building circulate? Because you got to make the air move, folks, because convection is the most powerful way to cool anything off. If air just stands still, it's not that cool. It is not that cool. Think about the one time you tried to jump into a pool. You stuck your feet in there. Oh, 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 no, no, I'm not getting there. It's too cold, man. Oh, no, no. And then your friend decides to help you out. <laughs> Walks past you and it bumps you in that water. And you jump in. Ah! Oh, oh, it's cold in here. It's cold in here. Why? Because when you jumped in the water, convection, you had to move across that water. Everybody follow me? The water moved past your body, sucked a ton of heat out of it. Everybody follow me? And conduction occurred. Then all of a sudden you stop moving. Oh, man, it's not even that cold. Oh, man, come on in. It's not that cold. How come all of a sudden it's not that cold? Because you've just lost your convection. Then why do you think as soon as you start swimming away, you feel cool again? Because you got your convection back. Convection is the most powerful way to cool off, folks. As long as the environment is moving past you, you'll cool off much quicker. All right, so the three ways to cool the body off. Other membrane functions. All membranes can depolarize. All membranes can depolarize. So let's look at membrane potentials. So Rashmi, here's a membrane. First thing, concentration gradient. Rashmi, there's, these electrolytes have more on the outside than the inside. This electrolyte has more on the inside than the outside. So by concentration gradient, Rashmi, which way does sodium want to move? Are you seeing the same picture I'm looking at, right? You seen the same picture I'm looking at? I'm telling you, Rashmi, there's more sodium on the outside. Which way does sodium want to move, in or out? Thank you. Which way does chloride want to move, Rashmi, in or out? Inside. Which way does bicarbonate want to move, in or out? In. Magnesium, in or out? In. Calcium, in or out? In. Potassium, in or out? Right here. Out. What is the most important principle of all movement, Nicole? Concentration gradient. So what Rashmi just told you, folks, is how you decide. If they ever ask you which way an electrolyte is going to move, you go back to the concentration gradient. Does everybody understand what I just said? That means later on when I start asking you questions about electrolytes now, before you start thinking about all the other fancy stuff we're going to talk about, just go back to concentration gradient. You're going to be right almost every time anyway. Does everybody understand that? Okay, Josh. All right, Tim. So here we go. So here's the concentration gradient. Now, it turns out there's actually more magnesium inside the cell. But the magnesium inside the cell is attached to all your kinases. So if they ask you, Cammie, where is there more magnesium? That way, you have to say inside, inside the cell. But only free electrolytes determine concentration gradient. So if they ask you where is there more free magnesium, you have to say outside. That's why the concentration gradient of magnesium is driven by that, not by all the magnesium in here attached. You understand, Then V? Now, same thing with calcium. There's actually more calcium inside the cell as well. However, it's all sequestered, Then V, inside the sarcoplasmic reticulum. So it's not floating around free, Chris. So that means there's more free calcium outside of the cell, and that's what determines the gradient. Do you understand, Omar? You understand, Nelson? You understand, Tamir? Okay. All right, now, every membrane in your body sits about minus 90 January. But there are two membranes in your body that sit about minus 70. Now, I can tell you what they are, but I'm going to show you how you can figure it out for yourself. To depolarize January, does that mean to get positive or negative? It means to get more positive. Everybody follow? So, Sandeep, minus 70, is that more positive or more negative from minus 90? Huh? More positive. Everybody understand? Minus 70 is more positive from minus 90. So if I got a, two membranes sitting at minus 70, are they going to be more or less likely to depolarize? Sandeep? More likely. Then all you do is think about to yourself, what two membranes are more likely to depolarize in your body? Dianel, you say? Purkinje fibers of the heart and neurons of the brain. That's how you remember Rather than just writing it down as just a list to memorize. No, no, I like, I like to figure things out for myself. All right, two membranes. Now, here's May. Here's how they put it on your board. All right, same old stuff, but it's coming at you differently. Ms. Johnson calls you at 2 o'clock in the afternoon and says, Ah, oh, Dr. May, Dr. May, 
my, my little boy Tommy, I heard him scream. He was in the living room. I was in the kitchen trying to cook up some, some of my macaroni. Oh, I got some good t macaroni too, Dr. May. Yeah, but anyway, yeah, my, my son, Tom, uh, little Tommy, I heard him scream. So I ran in the, into the living room, and I saw him with his finger in the socket. He had his finger in the socket. I, said, and I heard him go, ah! And his hair stood up just like that. His eyes were like, woo! And then he took his finger out, and then... He blew out smoke. I saw smoke, Dr. May. Smoke came out of his mouth. I looked at him, I, and he's got a little hole in the tip of his finger. And, and then I kissed it. I kissed it. it. It seems to be okay. Little Tommy's running around the house like nothing happened. But I decided to call you, and the first question he's going to ask you, Dr. May, should I take an emergency room? And May says. And May should say, then V. May should say yes. And the reason May should say yes is because when that child had his finger in a socket, what two membranes absorbed most of that current? Then V? The neurons of Purkinje's. Which means, May, what two complications are you worried about? Activity of the brain is called a seizure. Then you put it in those terms, a seizure and arrhythmias. That's why it's automatic, they got to go to the emergency room? Yes, automatic hospitalization too. All right, now, May, the additional information you need it takes about 24 hours for 90% of the current to dissipate out of your body. That's why it's going to be a 24 hour hospitalization. So I know they got to go to the emergency room. I know they got to be hospitalized. I know I got to keep them for at least 24 hours. Notice it's about the 90%. Didn't I tell you we're not trying to cure everybody? You can't keep nine people in the hospital to save one guy. That, that doesn't make any sense. Okay? 90% of the time, we know all the current is gone in 24 hours, so we say, okay, go home. And in fact, May, are you going to put them on a regular floor or a monitored bed? And now May understands clearly you got to put them on a monitored bed, even though little Johnny's running around. No, you got to be hooked up to a monitor now, Johnny. Of course, he's going to be upset. He has to now lay in bed, but he has to. I got to detect that arrhythmia. I got to detect seizures once they start. Okay, everybody understand? All right. A common thing that happens anytime you burn uh, the basement membrane with e electricity, you destroy the glycoproteins. The 2B, 3A, and 1B, the ones that platelets need to anchor to, they bleed like crazy in about two hours. In about two hours from now, a lot of blood will come squirting out of that little hole. That's why they try to throw you off and say, oh, there's only a little hole right here in his finger. Okay, wait about two hours from now and see what happens. It's going to be bleeding profusely. Okay, that's why we want him in a hospital when that happens, so we can help stop it. All right, the body, remember, skin is rapidly dividing, right, Michelle? So we know it can replenish all that stuff, but we don't want the child bleeding to death at home, so we'd rather have him here so we can put a lot of pressure on it until it regenerates, okay? All right, so electrolyte movement, concentration gradient. Then electrical gradient, then driving force, Nernst number. So we're going to go through these so I can show you what all these things are. So concentration gradient, we already talked about. And Ram, uh, Raspberry just told us which way every electrolyte is going to move, right, Diana? You understand? The next thing is the electrical gradient. The electrical gradient, Diana, is determined by your Nernst number. Now, I wrote the Nernst numbers for you. So, like, potassium is minus 96, sodium positive 65. Okay? The electrical gradient says which way would that electrolyte move? Which way, James, would that particular electrolyte move to take the membrane from the rest of the membrane potential, minus 90, to a nurse number, minus 96 for potassium. You understand, James? So I'm going to do the first one. You join in with the second one. Electrical gradient for potassium says, which way will potassium, a positive charge, move to take the membrane from minus 90 to minus 96, which is more negative? That means a positive charge has got to leave. That's how I know the electrical gradient of potassium favors for him to move out. Everybody understand how we just did that? All right. The electrical gradient of potassium says which way would potassium, a positive charge, have to move to take the membrane from minus 90 to minus 96, which is more negative? Well, to make the membrane more negative, a positive charge has to leave the cell. Potassium is positive, so he's got to leave. So that means the concentration gradient of potassium says to move out, the electrical gradient of potassium says to move out as well. You understand, Diana? All right, Diana, you do the next one. So for sodium, which way would the electrical gradient favor sodium moving to take the membrane from minus 90 to positive 65, in or out? Has to move in, because the membrane has to go from negative to positive. A positive charge would have to come in. Everybody follow? 
So that means, Andre, which way would chloride have to move to take the membrane from minus 90 to its own Nernst number? It stays where it is. That's how to remember that chloride likes everything exactly where it is. So the definition of a Nernst number, so you understand that better, is the membrane potential at which, the membrane potential, Jennifer, at which electrical and concentration gradients are equal and opposite. And Jennifer knows when things are equal and opposite, which way is their net movement? There is none. So it's chloride electrical gradient that balances its concentration gradient. Concentration gradient says, chloride, come on in. Electrical gradient says, no, you stay right here. And that's why they stay, chloride is the happiest at rest. Okay, has the least flux, least movement, however you want to say it. You understand now? The electrical gradient of chloride. He's the only one who's happy right now. Okay, what about magnesium, Michelle? The electrical gradient of magnesium favors him moving or her moving which way? In, because you got to go from minus 90 to positive 120. Al, calcium's electrical gradient favors moving which way? In as well. Everybody understand? From minus 90 to positive 120. Does everybody understand? Electrical gradient. That means they'll just change the number or something and ask you which way is electrical gradient favor that electrolyte moving. You just got to know how to figure it out. Which way would that electrolyte move to go from the membrane potential, whatever they give you, to his nurse number? Okay? The nurse number is a fixed number. That can't change. You can change the membrane potential. All right, next thing, driving force. Driving force says how fast would you move? You know, as in driving. How fast would you move? For those who like equations, is the E of the ion minus E of the membrane. For those who like conceptual, it's just the difference between the two numbers. You understand, Jessica? So, Jessica, you do one for me. So, driving force. Now, everybody watch. I'm going to do the first one. Driving force for potassium is what's the difference between the minus 90 and the minus 96? Just 6. That means potassium moves at 6 miles an hour, so to speak, you know, driving. Going which way? In or out, Jessica? Moves out. So potassium moves out of the cell at 6 miles an hour. All right, now, Jessica, you do the next one. Sodium moves how fast? Yeah, driving force. No, no, 65 minus minus 90. You have to add them up. What do you get? 155 miles an hour, going which way, in or out? Right. So sodium moves faster going in than potassium can move going out. Everybody understand that? I-30, no, Chukuma. What's the driving force for chloride? Zero. He's happy. Jenny, what's the driving force for magnesium? No, no, no. Ion minus minus 90. 210 miles an hour. What's the driving force for calcium, Eros? 210 miles an hour. Does everybody understand how we just calculate all those numbers? You understand, Diana? You understand, Lucas? That means potassium moves slowly. Sodium moves pretty fast, but magnesium and calcium move faster than that. You understand, Lucas? So that means, Lucas, if I ran a race between sodium and potassium, who gets the membrane first? Sodium would. Everybody agree with Lucas? All right, so, Diana, if I ran a race between sodium and calcium, who would get the membrane first? Calcium would. 155 versus 210. Everybody understand? If I ran a race between sodium and magnesium, Ajay, who would get there first? Magnesium would. Again, 155 versus 210 miles an hour. Everybody following? All right, so Tatiana, if I run a race between calcium and magnesium, who gets the membrane first? If I ran a race between calcium and magnesium, who gets the membrane first? They'll get there exactly at the same time. Tatiana, follow me again. If you run a race between sodium, calcium, and magnesium, who would get to the membrane last? Sodium would. Does anybody agree with Tatiana? Audelie, do you understand what she said? Kathy, do you understand what she said? Tamir, do you understand what she said? 
You find where I had a razor between sodium, calcium, and magnesium. Sodium will get there last. You understand, Tim? Does that make sense to you? Make sense, Michelle? You're meaning, you're trying to tell me, Tatiana, that calcium and magnesium get in the way of sodium? Does that make sense to you? Does it make sense, Janice? Does it make sense then why we use magnesium sulfate for preeclampsia? Oh, oh, is that what that is? Put magnesium in the way, guess what? Why does her seizure stop? Why do her arrhythmia stop? Why do I do her uterine cramp stop? And I can take it to OR and deliver that baby. Why do we use IV magnesium for ventricular arrhythmias? Oh, oh, I think I understand it now. Folks, magnesium and calcium get in the way of sodium. They can't fit through the same channel because they're two plus versus one plus. But they can sure get in the way. Do you understand, Diana? You understand, Sandy? Okay. All right, so that's driving force. Nernst number I already defined for you is the membrane potential at which electrical and concentration gradient are equal and opposite, and therefore, Dan, you have no net movement. Does that make sense to you? Make sense, Nita? Dahlia, you got a question? What, what was your question again? Yeah, if you run a race between sodium and potassium, sodium will get to the membrane first. Just sodium is going in, potassium is going out. Excuse me? Yeah, but he's rushing for the membrane trying to get out. Yeah, he's just trying to get out. I'm just saying who's going to get to the membrane first. So if the membrane is in the middle and I put potassium on, one, uh, on that side, on the in, inside the cell, sodium's on this side, on the outside, they start running for the membrane. Who's going to get there first? Well, potassium walking at six miles an hour. Sodium is 155 miles an hour. He'll get there first. Yeah, they're just going after the direction. That's all. Conductance, we give it the letter G, just means actual movement across the membrane. That means actual movement across the membrane. Because you can want to get across the membrane. You can move fast towards the membrane, but you actually get across, and that's conductance. And so that's why you got to understand what permeability is. Permeability, Diana, is the access across that membrane. You understand, Elizabeth? You understand, Tariq? Actual access. Well, here's a good way to summarize all of it, Sakchai. For any small ion, say channel. For ions, Brennan, say channel. If I ever ask you, how does sodium get across? Magnesium get across? Chloride get across? Everybody understand me? You say channel. Pores are medium-sized molecules. That's the only one you have to know is sweat. When you sweat out, you lose sodium, chloride, and water. Do you understand that? So that means, Al, when you exercise, what happens to your sodium levels? Should decrease. What about your chloride levels? Should decrease. What about your plasma volume levels? Should decrease as well. Thank you. Keep that in mind for another time. Anything that's large, you need a transport protein. Does that make sense to you, Andre? You understand, Andre? All right, Andre, look up on the screen. You got all these particles outside the cell. Tell me who out here is going to need a transport protein to get in. The bicarb, why is that? No. Tatiana, which one would you pick? Who would need a transport protein to go in? No. Ah, uh, Pernima, which one would you pick? She thought it was Barcar. Why? Uh, nope. Jessica, which one are you going to pick? Not magnesium or calcium. Ferdy, which one are you going to pick? Nope. Diana, which one would you pick? Nope, Sock Tai, which one are you going to pick? Nope, Josh, which one are you going to pick? Nope, Cammy, which one are you going to pick? All right, the answer is bicarb. Somebody explain it to me. It's the largest. It has nothing to do with charge. That's what I'm saying. I want to make sure you guys understand it. The only way I know you understand it is when you can answer my question about something I never talked about. 
because the students always shake their hair like this. Yeah, yeah, you understand. Right, till I ask your question. Same thing on a test. The test writer's going to have a whole different question than I'm giving you. You've got to truly understand it. So that means anytime you've got a large molecule, you've got to say it's a transfer of protein. Let me illustrate, give you a, a, an example. Years ago when I entered medicine, back in the 80s, you know in the books, biochemistry, they said glucose diffuses across the membrane. What? C6H1206, that's what they said, diffuses across the membrane. Now it took somebody brave to say, no, all the experts are wrong. That cannot be. Nothing that large diffuses across any membrane. And when you picked out on a test question, guess what? You were wrong, even though your book said that. So even the experts misuse the words, and yet you're still held responsible for misunderstanding what he said. Somebody had to challenge it and say, wait a minute, there's got to be a transfer protein. Years later, what showed up in the literature? Glute 1, glute 2, 3, 4, 5. But you've got to understand, how did somebody keep searching until they found out there's got to be glute transport proteins? Because he said, nothing that big just diffuses across the membrane. Even if you don't find it, it exists. That's what I'm saying, folks. You've got to understand the basics so that your knowledge is better than any book can tell you. Because I already know most books leave out a ton of stuff. Anytime the author doesn't understand, somebody misuses a word. But if you use that same word because you don't understand he's misused it, your answer will be wrong on any test. Even though you can quote for me where Robin said it, Harrison said it, great, but they were both wrong. That means now you've just joined that group. So that's why you got to be careful. You got to understand the basics. That's why we're, we're going to all the way back to the basics. All right. Primary active transport, two types of transport proteins. Primary active transport means you're going against a gradient. Primary active transport, James, means you're going against a gradient. The most common one you need to know, James, is a sodium potassium ATPase. See that? Any primary active transport has to have ATP. It's going to cost you energy. Why, James? If you're going against a gradient, that would never happen on its own. Do you understand that? You understand, Nita? You understand, Frank? All right. That's primary active transport. So anytime you're going against, against a gradient. On the boards, Tony, they won't always tell you you're going against a gradient. In fact, the Panther, they'll simply say you're concentrating. Hey, wait a minute, Sapanta. When you say you're concentrating, doesn't that mean there's more on one side than the other? Well, same thing, folks. Years ago, they didn't know anything about a hydrogen potassium pump in the stomach. But somebody had to challenge that and say, hey, wait a minute. How do you concentrate a pH of 1 to 2, then, in the stomach without an ATPase? That's impossible until they found out there's a hydrogen potassium ATPase. But, folks, that wasn't back in the 80s. You know, drugs like omeprazole and taprazole, they didn't come out in the 80s. What do you know about it? you got to understand that somebody keeps understanding this stuff and keeps challenging the status quo and say, wait a minute, it has to be this way because physiology says it has to be this way. And so that's why a lot of times on the boards they ask you general questions, questions they know you never read, questions they know your book never talked about, and say, well, how do you think this would happen? They're asking you to go back here, folks. You got to understand your basics to get it right. Okay? So primary active transport requires energy. So how does your thyroid concentrate iodine? Folks, even though we don't know there's an iodine ATPase, you know doggone well that one exists. That's my point. There's no book that says there's an iodine ATPase, but there's one that exists. Like right now, Seth Trioxin, one of the cephalosporins, concentrates in a CSF a hundred, no, a thousand times compared to plasma. A thousand to one, CSF to plasma concentration. Ceftriaxone. How does ceftriaxone get into the CSF, Nicole? Mm. What kind of transport protein are we talking about? The only two of them up here. Which one are you talking about? It has to be primary active transport. Folks, you know doggone well. When the Lord made your body, he didn't make a transport ATPase in the brain for ceftriaxone. You know how exciting this is? That somehow, some company has found a way to fool the most, the most specific, the, high, the most highly selective membrane. That you can fool it with a drug called ceftriaxone. That it concentrates so highly in the CSF. Number one, folks, that's how I know ceftriaxone is a drug of choice for meningitis without trying to read an article for you. I can figure that out. Number two. Imagine if we can come up with other antibiotics that can fool that same ATPase. Good Lord, instead of keeping people in the hospital for eight weeks for a fungal infection, we can get, you know, amphotericin B into the CSF without having to do lumbar punctures and then inject it in your back like that. That's the excitement. 
that, but it comes from the big picture, the big picture. Anytime you see concentration, there's an ATPase recognizing this. All right, secondary active transport means you're still using energy, but you're using the energy of sodium's concentration gradient. The most important secondary active transport is the sodium calcium exchange. In this case, three sodiums will go in and one calcium is pushed out. Secondary active transport means you're using the energy of sodium rolling down a gradient. Much like if you were rolling downhill or walking down here, you can pull a truck, but if you try to go uphill, you can pull that truck. Energy is created when you're going downhill. Okay? So secondary active transport, if you go in the same direction as sodium, we say co-transport or send port. Same direction. If you go in the opposite direction, Cassie, then we say antiport. Okay, so on the boards, of course, they'll tell you what direction you want to go, and that's how you remember. Everybody understand that? So, that means we've just covered how every, we've just covered all the pharmacokinetics. Done. Done, folks. You're never going to have to guess about what a drug, you know, the physiology tells you what a drug does. The effect is what you want, side effect is everything else you're going to get. So we know how to figure that out. Now we just figured out pharmacokinetics from membrane physiology. We can figure out half-life, where it's going to go, how to easy to absorb, acid or base, small or large, hard or uncharged, hepatonephrotoxic, without always looking these drugs up. All they got to do is tell you one thing about it. They almost always tell you how many times the patient took it. Folks, it's right there. The clue's there, but you don't know. That's the clue. Okay? Unless somebody points out to you, you would never know. There was a clue in that question. So students always, you know, try to tell me, oh, there was no clues on my test. I said, there's no such thing as a test without clues. It's only whether you recognize them or not, okay? Because then I can take it back to the exact same test, and I show them a clue to almost every question. And then I even tell them the exact lecture I gave it to them. But it means you never saw it because you didn't have it firm in your mind. That's why I say drill these clues every day, folks, if you want to truly score well on that test, okay? Right and understand. So primary and active trans. So that means now, as far as moving across the membrane, we just covered all of it. That means if I ask you, how do you absorb... Uh, Sodium in the jejunum, Tatiana, you say what? Janice, uh, mm -mm. Tony will tell you. So how does it get across the membrane? Through channels. That's my point. We just covered all of it. It's the only whether you really heard that or not. Because that means when we get to GI and you ask, how does an ion go across the GI lumen, you say the same thing, folks. If you start hesitating, start thinking of something else because you ran out of some book, guess what? You're going to miss it on the test. That means if I ask you, how do you get glucose absorbed in the jejunum, Tony, you say what? You have to say what? Transport protein. Co-transport. See that? Because it's going in the same direction as sodium. That means I don't have to keep looking these things up. That means if you're in pulmonary and you ask me, how does it get across? I'll tell you the same thing. If we get the neural and you ask me, how does it get across? Blah, 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 I'll tell you the same thing again. It's not going to change once you understand the basics. This is what I mean by applying it. That means if they ask you on OB about moving across the... Placenta, that's how I figured it out. Not because I got to go read an OB book, but because the placenta is just another membrane. And if you don't see it as that, you'll swear, oh, my God, they asked me OB questions on boards one. <laughs> and then you miss it. You miss the whole concept behind the question. And that's what shocks students. When they see questions out of context with what they read, they start panicking.